Thanks for joining this episode of the number 86 lecture series, in which Professor Richard Epstein discusses torts and the Roman law. In episode two, he explains how Roman tort law differs from Anglo-American tort law and the importance of determining causal connections. This lecture is part of a series with Professor Epstein on how this ancient legal system can provide crucial insights about modern problems. Professor Epstein is one of the most prominent legal scholars of our day. He is the inaugural Lawrence A. Tisch Professor of Law at NYU School of Law, a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution, and Professor of Law Emeritus and a senior lecturer at the University of Chicago. As always, the Federalist Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. At the end of episode one on torts, you discussed a bit about how the Romans thought about casual connections. Can you give us a fuller outline about that? How does the Roman tort law differ from our modern Anglo-American tort law? Modern American law makes an absolutely fatal mistake in my judgment because it does not start with the close cases and then start to work out. What it does is it introduces a very fuzzy notion of but-for causation, which is saying, but for the occurrence of this, that would not have happened, sort of counterfactual situation. And there's no very tight physical or temporal connection that is inherent in the but-for formulation. So everybody knows that it may be a first approximation for causation, but you have to add other stuff in. The most common candidate is foreseeability, which really doesn't do the kind of work that you need to have done on it. So what the Romans did is they actually lucked into the right solution, tight connections first, and then the theory of causation is how far can you extend this kind of relationship and still say that we've got ourselves of these physical sorts of connections. So then how do you actually do that? Well, the first case they give is essentially you take your hands and you strangle somebody. And somebody wants to deny that that's force, you could say it's metaphorical. And then the other thing you could do is you could punch them. But suppose now what you do is you put in your hand a sword and you slay him. Does the introduction of an instrument essentially change the nature of the causation so that we say you did not do it because you had this sword in your hand? And if you look at the ordinary use of transitive verbs in the English language and somebody says, I shot him, I clubbed him to death and so forth, you have exactly the same direct connection by the use of force with respect to these instrumentalities that are under the exclusive control of another individual. Uh, so it turns out that the direct action under the statute for a kidder applies in these particular kinds of cases. And then the things start to become just a little bit more complicated in a whole variety of situations. And one of the famous illustrations that we start to use is you have somebody, and what you do is you throw him off a cliff, and he hits the water, and he doesn't die uh, from the immediate blow, but he drowns exhausted after desperately trying to save himself. Have you killed him by force? And the answer is, well, uh, we don't think you've killed him by force because his thrashing around was an act that intervened, and so therefore, you're not going to recover. And most people, when they hear that, they think it's too clever by half. Uh, essentially, the application of force is what put you in danger, and every single action that you took as the victim was an effort to try to ameliorate the force, not to try to compound its effect, right? And so if that's the way in which the situation works, why would we want to take this thing out from underneath the statute? And so by way of careful case exposition, they decided that that case too was one which was covered by O'Kittery. Now, where does the moment of truth come with respect to these systems? Well, Romans had a peculiar penchant for poisoning one another, as anybody who's ever seen um, I, Claudius, will know. And what is it that when you're dealing with poison tells you whether you're within the class of Echidera or outside of it? And the first thing to know, of course, about these poisons is that the dangerous potential that you have from the situation is not from the physical connection, right? Uh, throwing some poison down your throat doesn't kill you in the same way a short does, but the chemical interactions between what you swallow and everything else that happens is different. And so does that change the basic rule of the situation? And the Romans thought about this for a long time, and they said so long as you forced it down their mouth, uh, the digestive juices and stuff that works on this are no different than the thrashing about that you have by the man who's been thrown off the edge of the cliff. So we're going to treat that as though it's a case of direct force and it's covered by the statute. 
But this then invites the following kind of question uh, for which you really need to have an answer. Suppose you're a little bit different under these circumstances, and instead of using brute force, you decide to resort to a little bit of old-fashioned uh, deception in order to achieve the same result. And so what you do is you take some substance, which looks like soup or food, and you slip into it some poison. You put it in front of somebody and say, here is your dinner, here is your dessert. What they do is they eat or drink the stuff that's put in front of it, and they die. At that particular point, it is very difficult for somebody to say that you force this thing down their throat. And so it's very difficult to say that this is a case of okidera. And then what you do is you ask the next question. Okay, it's not a kidder. Do we really want to let this guy off scot-free when, in fact, the dangers of insidious behavior may, in fact, be much more serious than the dangers of the direct use of force against somebody? Why is that? Because if somebody wants to force any food down your mouth, you're going to fight like hell in order to resist it. But on the other hand, if they slip this poison to you in a deceptive fashion, uh, then you might eat it only two hours later to wake up dead because of all the chemical effects that it has. And again, you start asking people, is this a simple transitive verb type arrangement that you kill them? They said, no, you set the poison in front of him and he ate it. Uh, he may have caused the death, but it's not like he shot him, he kicked him or whatever. And so the Romans then introduced a absolutely critical distinction into their system to cover these analogous cases that are not reached by the statute. And that's the distinction between Ochidera and causa mortis prestara. And that mysterious Latin phrase, causum mortis prestare, means furnishing a cause of death. And if you apply it to the poison case, it seems to fit exactly like a T. And so then what you have to do is to say, how do we analyze these particular cases? And then we take a leaf from Aristotle to figure out what's going on, and we find three cases, one of which I've already mentioned to you, uh, which is the case in which you deceive somebody uh, so they take it down. And the general rule about causal intervention is if you, a defendant, create deliberately a false impression that reduces somebody's omission, his action does not break the chain of causation because it was induced by your mistake. It'd be much more difficult if it turns out that the mistake was created by a third party and the Romans don't have a clean answer to that, nor does anybody else, uh, but at least in this particular case, it's there. The second case, which is equally apparent, is as follows. Suppose I put the poison down in front of you, and you know it's poison, and I know that you know it's poison. I said, here's your choice. Either you take this poison, and what will happen is you will die peacefully in your sleep, or you don't take that poison, and I'm going to club you to death, and you will feel miserable for three hours before you die. Your choice. Now, we all prize freedom of choice, and generally speaking, if given the choice, we would take the less painful thing. But because A is less painful than B, then doesn't mean that it's a legitimate sort of choice. And so any action which is done under threat of duress by somebody else, where the threat is involves the use of force, again, doesn't sever the nature of the causal chain. Uh, so what happens quite naturally in Latin, what you develop is a situation where you start looking at actions that take place subsequent to what the defendant does, right? And prior to the time of death, and you ask about whether these new intervening act, novus actus interveniens, inessentially override the situation. Many modernists regard this phrase as intellectual mumbo jumbo, but if you start from the world of trespass and start working backwards like that, uh, the intervening act is the most natural way to look at the situation. And what you realize is that some of these interventions, in effect, don't sever the causal connection, and other of these are conventions do. Well, what's the kind of connection that we have which starts to do the severance that starts to take place, I think becomes a very fair question to ask. And here's the situation that you have to create. You must negate ignorance on the one hand, and you must negate coercion on the other hand. And so you put the poison in front of somebody and say, look, here it is, it's poison. Uh, you've indicated that you'd like to kill yourself. I'm trying to help you make this decision. I'm not going to tell you what to do, uh, but I'm just going to make this nice and handy. You decide. And so generally speaking, if there's full knowledge and no coercion, then it turns out that the causal change comes to an end usually. But of course, there are always going to be difficult cases. Suppose it is that you put in front of somebody whom you know is chronically depressed uh, and mentally impaired in a given way, 
And you assume that when you give them the true information, what they're going to do is essentially act on this in a perfectly irrational way, given all of their known physical and mental disabilities of which you are completely aware. And so these then become very hard cases as to whether or not by furnishing a cause of death to somebody who has incomplete control over them, do you treat the incomplete control in the same fashion that you teach the mistake or you do the coercion. And what you have to say about these situations is as follows. Honest people can surely differ about the ways in which you treat these marginal cases. The question is not whether or not these marginal cases give you disputes, but whether or not you could locate the margin at a particular point that is sufficiently clear uh, that there are large numbers of clear cases on both sides of the line. And generally speaking, with any legal system where you have to define the difference between those consequences which are not too remote and those consequences which are too remote, now furnishing a cause of death as a form of indirect causation, right, essentially presupposes a very stylized situation where you give something to somebody. But it turns out, of course, that when you're dealing with remoteness of damages, you should treat that only as a subset of a larger class of cases, creating dangerous conditions under which the actions of either the individual injured party or a third party start to take place. And so here's a variation on the particular theme, which essentially everybody seems to understand. Uh, you don't kill somebody. What you do is you put a trap in the road, and then what you do is you cover the trap over uh, with some sod so it's indistinguishable from everything before and after. And somebody comes down the road with a horse or on foot, and what they do is they fall through the trap and they get killed by being impaled on the spikes which have been conveniently set there as well. And now what you do is you come up and you say, you know what, I am not responsible for this death because the actual force that was applied was by gravity when it pulled you into these stakes. And whatever happens to gravity, that's God's responsibility. That's Isaac Newton's responsibility. It turns out not to be mine. Now, if you go and you look through the entire annals of the law, there's never been a legal system under any sort, kind, or description which has accepted that particular argument. Well, the question then is why not? And it's exactly the same problem that you had in dealing with the poison. What you did here was you created a latent defect, one which was not known to the person. And so when they stepped on that particular piece of sod, which was not supported by firm earth, essentially they acted under a system of mistake. Once they act under mistake, it turns out that their particular actions are charged back to the defendant who made the pit and not charged to the plaintiff as loan. So even though the setting on the road and the setting with the poison look in some sense to be wildly diverse, the fact that there's a latent defect uh, which causes harm uh, when the ordinary actions of the plaintiff essentially is involved is in fact good reason to say that the causal connection is not going to be severed. The obvious follow-up question is whether there are cases where the casual connection will be severed. Can you give us an example? Here, of course, it is easy to find those particular cases if you keep your eye on the distinction between a latent or hidden defect and a patent or an obvious defect. So just change the situation. Then somebody puts a pit in the road, and there's some spikes there. It's the middle of broad daylight. Um, and what somebody does is they come along, and they see this particular pit. And one of the things they can say is, I have a right to use this highway. And if you create this obstruction and dangers, I'm going to use it anyhow. And if anything happens to me, uh, then I'm going to be able to sue you for the full damages. And there's nobody who, in their right mind who thinks that people are allowed to do that or that anybody would want to do that. So in the event of the perfectly obvious defect, the response is either you stop and turn around or what you do is you go around the thing. Does this mean that you're entitled to no damages? Well, the correct answer is there's now a different form of liability, and that's the liability that is associated with blocking somebody's right of way. Uh, but if you think about it again for another second, and you could take 10 steps to the left and then go forward on your path without having to worry about anything, do we really want to bring a cause of action for the 10 seconds delay that is otherwise done? De minimis non curat lex. If it turns out, however, when they put this blockade, what you have to do is to change routes and you have to go somewhere else and take a canoe or extra expenses, then in effect what happens is 
or you can recover the cost of mitigation associated with avoiding the hazard. But since those costs are vastly lower than getting yourself impaled upon that, you cannot go headlong into the particular situation. And so what we then do is we start to analyze the choices that somebody makes when confronted with a known difficulty to see whether or not they have or have not acted in accordance with the basic rules. So to give a famous English case uh, from about 1885 or so, which kind of illustrates this pattern, is you have somebody who owns a ship and the ship is badly disabled when it turns out it's hit by somebody else. And the captain with his basically impaired vessel in complete control over the steering mechanism, the loss of his logs and his other devices for navigation is trying to make his way to port and he runs ashore on some kind of a shoal. And the question is, can the guy who rammed into the ship say, look, it's not my fault because it was he who beached the ship, not me. And the answer that was given by the English cases is you can't possibly do this. And why is that? Because it's the same thing that we talked about in the Roman situation. And that is, so long as the fellow who's sailing the ship is under an impairment because he doesn't have his full control over his vessel and the full information on where he goes, he is going to be fully protected so long as we know he's trying to avoid future harm rather than to create it. And so the recovery is going to be allowed. Now, does this mean that recovery is indefinite? The answer is, of course not. And what are the situations? One is he's got an impaired boat, and he sees an obstacle in front of him, and he says, oh, goody, and he decides to sail the ship into trouble. At that particular point, since he had the capacity to avoid the harm and deliberately chooses to encounter it, it's going to be on his side of the ledger, not somebody else. So we have one form of causal intervention, which ends the chain of causation. And then the second situation is he makes it safely to port. And what somebody then does is fix the rigging on the boat and restores the logs. And he now goes out a week later than he otherwise would have done. And because he's a week later, he gets hit by some kind of a storm, which wouldn't have happened if he'd gone out a week earlier. Can he recover for that? And the answer is almost always no. And the reason is, if you would come early, you'd have the same probability of being injured by a storm. So what we do is we substitute in one probability of, say, 0.01 for another probability of 0.01. And it turns out that we just don't want to give you insurance against that probability unless there is, quote, unquote, an increased risk or hazard of some damage taking place. So the standard illustration of that makes perfectly good sense. What you do is you derail somebody from a train, and now it's dark and they have to walk back through a woods, and they're attacked by a stranger. It turns out there's an increased risk of hazard until you reach a position of safety. So you who created the risk are responsible. And you're responsible even though there's a third person who's obviously wrong because they've committed a deliberate trespass against your person. But once you reach the point of safety, namely the house to which you are headed, and something happens to you there, unless there's still an increased risk or hazard, which is highly likely, then you're not there. So the point about the Roman system is that it not only creates situations where you know what the liability is, but it also creates very clear rules which indicate this far and no further so that causation doesn't have this infinite capability of spreading throughout the world and bringing everything down in its way. Thank you for listening to this episode of the number 86 lecture series. The spirit of debate of our founding fathers animates all of the number 86 content. Encouraging discussion and critical reflection relative to how each subject is widely understood and taught in law schools and among law students. Subscribe to the number 86 lecture series on your favorite podcast platform to have each episode delivered the moment it's released. You can also go to fedsoc.org forward slash number 86 for lectures and videos on federalism, separation of powers, the judiciary, and more. That's F-E-D-S-O-C dot org slash N-O-8-6. Thanks for listening. See you in class.